Oh, here we are again, folks. Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. I've got a, a lot in my mind today. I tell you what, I can't hardly figure out where to start. We need to, we're going to have a generation. There was a generation in the Bible. The Bible said that knew not Joseph, that didn't know Joseph. After a, a few uh, generations, after Joseph had uh, got the children of Israel out of Egypt, he had kept them alive in Egypt, and they had left Egypt. Remember, some 70 souls went in, some 2 million left out. And then a few generations later, they had forgot all about the goodness of God that had come through this man Joseph. Well, we had another man come on the scene later on in uh, the Bible. His name was Jesus. And now we have a generation in front of us. Right now, there is a generation in front of us that know not Jesus. They don't know who he is. All they know is he's a cuss word, a byword. And uh, I said to a man one time, I asked him, he said, well, I don't believe in God. Well, I said, how come you take his name in vain if you don't believe in him? And I said, I've said this to many a man, and it's a little bit rude. But if God did what you asked him to do, you would be damned and in hell forever. When you're using that kind of language, and if God did exactly what you just said, you'd be damned and in hell forever because you're not saved. So you need to be careful uh, how you use the name of God. And look, we've got this generation out here today that don't know where they came from. Uh, a question a child would ask, where did I come from? It's not the fact that it came from his mother's belly that you need to tell him. You need to tell him, excuse me, <coughs> that God created the heavens and the earth. And on the uh, sixth day he made a man. And that man he put on this earth and told that man to subdue it. And that's where, they, that's where mankind comes from the creation of God, not from an amoeba, not from a big bang, not from a speck of dust, not from anything else. A common sense would tell you that these two eyes that work like they work and tell your brain what they tell you just by looking at something my brain says this is a computer in front of you and it's turned on and it's time for you to talk and my eyes show me that if i was blind and i couldn't see i would have to have a buzz or something and then my ears would tell me it's time for me to talk and i'd have to hear a buzz or something and would tell me it's time to quit talking but my eyes tell me by sight uh what it's doing and my mouth's doing the talking where is it talking from? It's talking from what my eyes and my head is telling my brain to say. That is not something that just came about. It did not just come about or just happen. No, it is a true and living thing. That we are, we're, we're finally and fitly put together. Listen to what God said here. Acts twenty thirty two. He said, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified all of the Old Testament saints that were sanctified by Jesus Christ his blood that he shed <clears throat> when he took paradise to heaven set it down with God that's all of the people from the beginning of the earth who were sanctified and then it comes you and I along in a new era, but on the same earth. And we are to do the same thing. We are to proclaim the word of God. It, different from the law. We are to do it by grace, he says here. And it's by grace which is able to build you up. The grace of God that he died for you and I. That you and I could be built up by following the word of God. You know, the enemy, the devil, uh, knows the scripture. Uh, he, when the devil tempted Jesus during uh, Matthew chapter 4, where uh, Christ was being tempted by the devil, by the way, when he was being tempted was when he was on a 40-day fast. 
The devil's going to come you in after you on your weakest point. Your weakest point. Here you are going through life. You're following the Lord. Things are looking good. And all of a sudden, a great shaking comes in your life. Just because you're following God doesn't mean you're not going to have a great shaking someday. Somebody you really love just got killed in a car wreck. Well, even uh, God forbid this to happen to you, but your wife comes home and says, Hey, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this Christian living and whatever, and I'm going to divorce you and go down the road. And, and here you are left, and you, you're a Christian, you're following God, and you're saved. And all of a sudden, this woman has torn herself out of your life and because she doesn't want to follow your Christian life. That happens. It happens. What do you do in these circumstances? You buckle down and you uh, ask Christ to uh, bring you through that. Now, God was tempted, Jesus was tempted by the devil three times in this occasion, this one time. The devil comes to him. And Jesus says to the devil, it is written. Jesus says that to the devil three times. It is written. Out of Deuteronomy, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, let's see, uh, where is it? Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, I thought I had the numbers down here, but I don't. But it's in the book of Deuteronomy every time Jesus quoted to him. But the last quote where it says in the Bible, it is written, the devil says it, says it to Jesus. He took him up on that pinnacle and he said, It is written that God has given the angels watch over you, that you won't even dash your foot against a rock. And he took it completely out of context, but he, he did that to Jesus and he said, It is written. And uh, in Matthew 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, and... Uh, uh, to bear thee up, lest at any time thou would dash thy foot against a stone. And Satan quoted from Psalm 91, 11, and 12. But it, believe it or not, he took it out of context, and he didn't actually say it exactly what it, the way it was meant. Uh, it's painfully obvious to you and I that our adversary knows the Word of God. And he knows, he knows what, only what he sees of you. He doesn't know your inner thought or your inner being. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He can't be at all places at all times. And he's not omniscient. He doesn't know what's before you in your mind like God does. God's omniscient. And <clears throat> he can be all people at all times and understand. Uh, we need to be careful lest the devil get advantage of us. Uh, Paul was our example. Paul the Apostle, who was Saul originally, uh, was probably one of the greatest Christians as far as the word being Christ-like as uh, there was on the earth. Uh, it's difficult for me when I get a speeding ticket to be congealed. And Paul got beat and he was congealed. He won those to the Lord. He was put in prisons. He won those in the prison to the Lord. He was careful to wherever he was to not do anything that would offend the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did everything in within the gospel, the doctrines of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, look at 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. And, and see, it says, For I am now ready to be offered the time of my departure is hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid out for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing, and uh, give me that day, and love his appearing. And uh, he is going to up here one day. Now, he was talking to Timothy and asked Timothy to bring him the cloak and the parchment that he had left in Troas. Uh, it was a funny thing. Paul would go from the prison in Troas <laughs> to the prison in Antioch or wherever he was headed. And uh, some people said, uh, 
first thing Paul checked out when he came to town was what the jail facility looked like because he knew he was going to visit it before he got done. The Bible alone provides the answer to life. Spiritual life is found in, only in God's Bible. The God of heaven, the big G God. The Bible is the only one that has the answer to life. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. The, <clears throat> the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. This is the answer today that we need to pass on that God was and is the creator of every single solitary thing that is on this earth, in this earth, and what happens. Not the Big Bang. We have a generation being taught in the schools today, from the White House to the schoolhouse, that man was a, came from a monkey. And uh, just, I'm, I'm a, a fairly ignorant human being, but as ignorant as I am, and I've been studying 40 years in the Bible and reading behind other people, I have found out that there is no possible way that the skull of a monkey could end up to be the skull of a human being. There are too many factors, uh, geometrically, bone factors, uh, that could uh, not allow that. It could not be allowed. It could not possibly happen. If evolution were a truth, it wouldn't have evolution into the, a man with the skull that we have. If it had evolution into a man, it would have still had the skull of the monkey. And the skull of a monkey and the skull of a man are absolutely, positively, 100% different. What does it take to be different? Just one thing. Just one thing. There are several in the skull of a monkey and a man that are different, but it only takes one to be different. <laughs> so, different is different. Honest, honest, and a lie is a lie. Honest is honest, and the non-truths are non-truth. And this is a non-truth that man came from a monkey. And so uh, that's the end of it. <clears throat> if it's a non-truth, then there's no truth in the Big Bang Theory. There's no truth in all of these things they list in our dictionaries, in our uh, beautiful books. I have some of the best world books you've ever seen, but they've got a page in there that shows this evolution thing from Mr. Darwin that, that by the way, refuted it all just before death and said he was wrong. Over every creeping thing and everything man was given. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100 and verse 3. We are the sheep of his pasture. Wow. And he is the good shepherd not just the shepherd he is the good shepherd he is the only shepherd he is the only shepherd wow now why am i here let's look at the conclusion of the matter why am i here uh, ecclesiastes 12 13 says the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear god and his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. What is the whole duty of man? Sum it up in Ecclesiastes. The counsel of the whole man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Since I got saved, 1972, November 5th, 3 o'clock in the morning, I have feared the Lord and uh, wonderfully. He's wonderful. The fear that I have of Him is a wonderful fear. It's a fear that I need to be careful that I don't misquote anything from his word. Otherwise, the things that are given to me in the word will be taken away from me and added unto me. So I have to preach the truth. If I am a true Christian, which I am, then I have to preach the truth. There are many false teachers. 
every uh, man, every person that preached in the Word of God that is written down in the annals of God has quoted this verse said there are many false preachers and Jesus himself said there are false preachers uh, is thou art worthy O Lord look at Revelations 411 we, we went from Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament to the uh, down almost to the end of the Bible in Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. For God's pleasure, he created man, and he created all things for his pleasure. He created the man to tend the earth. He created the earth for the man and created the man to tend the earth. God doesn't need air. God doesn't need trees. God doesn't need lakes and rivers and oceans full of fish and stuff. He made all this stuff for man. He put the creatures in the ocean for us to be able to survive on, to eat on. He knew that the earth itself, the, uh, the ground itself, would not yield enough food for the amount of people that's going to be in the world. So he put things in the sea that could be eaten. Probably 20% or more of our food comes from the sea and the rest from the land. And there's going to be a curse on the land and is a curse already that it yield not and it's not going to yield. You can have a crop within five days of ready to harvest and the Lord can bring a wind through there, a hailstorm through there and you won't eat one piece of it. You won't eat a thing of it. He can bring uh, the rain. I, I was out in Ohio and I said something to a lady in Ohio about how good God was and everything. And she said, well, it wasn't too good to us. Our wheat crop is underwater and we'll not harvest anything from it. And I'm having to be a waitress over here in a restaurant in order to make enough money to keep from taking our farm away. So you see the crop can fail. The crop can fail. Anybody's crop can fail. God can come, touch the crop. And the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23, my favorite psalm. Psalm 23. And the Lord is my shepherd. And he does lead me. And he does give me. He leads me in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul on a minute by minute and hour by hour basis. There's 168 hours in a week and God has to lead me every minute, 60 minutes and every one of them hours. And God has to lead me. I could quote you the seconds, but I won't. God has to lead me through every second of every hour of every minute of every day. If he's not leading me, I'm in trouble. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Wow. Revelations 20 and 15. My friend, if you're not found written in the book of life, you will be cast into the lake of fire, where forever and ever you will burn in hell fire with the damned and with the devil. I'll say this, we'll throw this little comment in right here. The devil, the hell was created for the devil and his fallen angels that were following him. If you go to hell, you will be an intruder in hell. You were not designed to go there. You were designed to go be with God forever. That's why he made man, mankind to come and worship him. We read all through the Bible about babies being killed, babies being killed, babies being killed. Babies being killed. We live in America today where hundreds of thousands of babies are being aborted and being killed. And you know what the Lord said? Jesus said to the disciples when uh, the children came to him, he said, Such is the kingdom of God. And around the throne, these little ones are. Around the throne, all the babies are being killed uh, up there now. Around the throne, condemning those that killed them. Those that killed them will be condemned for this and uh, I do not believe that a true Christian person can abort a baby a true follower of God would say 
I will get out of the profession before I would kill a live baby. Uh, murder. That's murder. Killing a baby is murder. Let's get back in the Bible here, over here. Because we'll never have the opportunity to apply all the verses we study. I'll never have the opportunity to apply all the verses I study. So I need to apply those that I can. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, uh, In heaven there hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, and will with the temptation also make a way of escape. God is going to make a way of escape for every temptation that comes your way. Every temptation that comes your way. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13. In heaven, there will be no temptations. <laughs> and when we get to heaven, there will be no temptation. But while we're on this earth, we are going to be tempted minute by minute, day by day, hour by hour. We're going to be tempted of the devil. That's his, that's his job. He is our nemesis. He is the one to tempt us. If you have a permanent limp, which a lot of people do, and it's a, an aggravating thing daily, every day you've got this limp, and it's as uh, aggravating as can be on a daily basis. That's the way the devil is. He's like that limp. He's a tempter every day. He's there. Uh, listen to this. Uh, well, let's see. First John 1 John 1.9. Listen to this one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. I'm teaching out of the Bible this morning. I am teaching today, excuse me, out of the Bible. Uh, in heaven there will be no sin. If all, all, A-L-L, -L, all unrighteousness is in hell, all righteousness is in heaven. You will not, contrary to many beliefs, you will not ascend into heaven with any sin on you that you will be charged for in heaven. No sin will enter into heaven. On your way up, in the twinkling of an eye, the dross will be burned off from you, and you will enter into heaven 100% pure, just as if you had never, ever sinned. Justification, that's what justification is. Just as if you had never sinned. When David entered into heaven, all the things that David had physically done on this earth, that you and I would look at and say, well, David, that was a sin. 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 God said, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, David. Those things you did in the flesh, I have forgiven you of those. You are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven with a pure heart. And, da and the Lord said, David's heart was after him. He had a heart after God. David did. David did, may have did these sins, but there was no pleasure in those that they ended up. And you and I are the same way. If you are saved, and you are following God, and all of a sudden you fall backwards and you go get drunk or something, there's no pleasure in that. There's nothing in that but degradation and evil in your mind and in your heart. And you say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. You'll cry and beg and do everything else. Let me tell you what, you don't have to cry and beg and do everything else. All you have to do is just say, Lord, I have sinned. Forgive me. And it's behind you. Don't wear it. Don't carry it. Don't flaunt it. Don't bring it up again. It's in the past. It's done. It's cast in a sea of forgetfulness. Never more to be remembered. God said, what I forgive, I forgive permanently. You'll never, ever have that brought up to, and thrown in your face. You will not be judged for that. The Bible said, judge yourself lest you be judged. Everything you judge yourself for, right this second, right now, whoever's watching this, I don't care who you are, if you're watching this, this second right now, ask God to forgive you for every single solitary thing in the past, all the way up to the past second. <clears throat> if you do that, he has forgiven you. To Right now, you are perfect. 
you are pure and you stand before God perfect and pure and all those sins you've asked him to forgive you of. Does that mean that you don't have anything you may have to make right on the earth? No, you still may have to make some things right. There are consequences for some things. If you've got a court date ahead of you and you just ask God to forgive you, He's forgiven you all that, but you may have to go to court and you may have to go to jail for something you did, but you've been forgiven of it as a sin. But you may have to pay the consequences. The, the consequences for running a stop sign is pay the fine. And so you may have to pay the fine. There's going to be in heaven no more opportunity to do what the opportunity is on the earth today. Our opportunity today on the earth is to preach the gospel to all the world. Take the gospel to all the world and preach the gospel. This is what we're supposed to do. Ah, uh, in Philippians 4.19, it says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ. Now, that's a need on the earth that we have everything furnished on the earth. When we get to heaven, everything will be furnished. There will be no working for something in heaven. It's all going to be there, given to us forever, permanently. And what we will do with the time in between, I believe in God has a use for us. I believe he's going to give some cities some one, some two, some three, some five cities to watch over to be, be, if you please, to be the mayor or to be something. I don't know how it's going to be. The Bible said it has not entered the mind to comprehend the goodness of heaven or what it's going to be. Paul got a vision of it. He was carried there one time for a bit. And, uh, and then he came back to the earth and lived 14 more years. And uh, so... Uh, there will be an opportunity to apply some things. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I go to prepare that place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. Look at that word unto myself. Jesus himself is going to receive you when you enter into heaven. Jesus himself is going to say, hey bro, <laughs> hey brother, come on in. Wow, man. Yeah, it's Jesus himself. And where I am, he may be also. That's John 14, 1 through 3. There will be no more sorrow, no more weeping, no more crying, no more shedding of tears, no more anything. Listen, if all the bad and all the evil is in hell, none of it is in heaven. Is there things that are bad? Yes, there are. If they're bad, if they're evil, they're not going to be in heaven. Only evil things are going to be in hell only. The last but not least, listen to this. Psalm 23 and 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That is a saying for this earth. We will be the rod and staff when we get to heaven. We will be the rod and staff perhaps for another something going on in the future. The thousand year reign, where are we going to be? We're going to be in heaven with the Father. We're going to be in the new Jerusalem. We're going to be there. All the gates, 12 gates are there, and they're all open day and night. There's going to be a river flow from that uh, throne of God up there. It's going to have 12 trees with 12 manner of fruit on them for the healing of the nations, it says. Wow. Man, uh, we don't understand that, but God's got, got something prepared ahead of us, for us, that we're going to have. Well, our time is about come and gone. Uh, we, we, have, we have to live by faith. We have to live by faith. My friend, live by faith. There's no other way but in God to live than other than by faith. God is God. He sent His Son to die for us and by faith. Ask Him to forgive you your sin. Come in your heart and save your soul. You will go to heaven when you die. And you don't have to be rich, poor, or any other thing. 
Just ask by faith. Our time's come and gone. We'll see you next time, Brother Peter, with tidbits from the Word. Bye-bye.